uh, section on hiring and, and staffing, it seemed like there was a concentration to um, maybe hire uh, several attorneys. And as an alternate suggestion, has, have you considered reaching out to the attorney general's office and using their already staffed attorneys to advise technical staff and staff that you're going to hire to, uh, to, uh, to work on the policies, provisions of auditing and all of the nuts and bolts and, and things that, that need to be done. Uh, because I agree with Mr. Lee that, uh, you know, technical staff and privacy professionals that have been working with GDPR, CCPA, PEPIDA, the numerous privacy laws throughout the world are probably in a better position to provide uh, better technical advice at implementing this, this consumer-based law that was approved by the voters. And that's one of the last stresses that I wanted to uh, convey is I hope that the focus of your agency is on the consumer. Uh, when you were talking about real estate, uh, I would think that since this is a, uh, you know, supposed, supposed to be the benefit of the consumer, a more, uh, a location that is uh, uh, better suited to the consumer to be able to come in uh, once we have that capability post COVID uh, would be better suited rather than a state building. Caller, where, you have 15 seconds remaining. Where they may not be uh, free to come in and express a concern about their particular privacy concerns. So that's some of the synopsis of the uh, comments that I already sent to you via email. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Wright, for your comment. Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there further public comment? I'm seeing no additional comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. Um, I um, propose that we have two options here. Um, one would be for the board to approve uh, per diem policy with amendments um, that we decide in the meeting, and Ms. Sierra and I will make those amendments. Um, the second would be for Ms. Sierra and I to make amendments and bring them back to the next board meeting. Um, I am agnostic on which option you take, but I understand the amendments to be number one, to remove any requirement or apparent requirement to report actual hours and instead only record days worked. And number two, um, to replace the um, six hour um, definition um, uh, with um, e either um, a um, requirement or guidance. Um, again, I'm agnostic um, that a per diem, uh, per diem, to claim a per diem, one should do um, substantial work, and that is not X. Um, I, um, uh, we could, we could, um, we could um, move forward in either, either fashion. Um, uh, I am fine with either, um, Ms. De La Torre. So my suggestion is that um, we approve it now with the understanding that those changes are going to be made. I think it's the more expeditious way. And then maybe um, we can uh, discuss the guidance on what will be the minimum that should um, we, we should consider in, in a future min meeting or, or um, I guess in a meeting, I, I guess there's no other way to discuss it, but um, just, just make it a guidance that can be a paragraph that is uh, provided to, to the members as, you know, do not report this or do report these, these other situations. Um, it just seems to me that's more expeditious. If I'm wrong about that and the other option is faster, then um, I'm, I'm flexible. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I support that. Mr. Phillips, is that an appropriate form of motion? Yes, I think that would work. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, then I will ask the board um, if I could have a motion to approve uh, the um, a form of the per diem policy that the uh, startup and administration subcommittee uh, recommends with the following changes. The first is that there is no requirement um, or apparent requirement to report hours 
that members will only report days. And secondly, that the um, six hour definition of a per diem be struck and be replaced by guidance to board members as to what counts sufficiently, excuse me, sufficiently substantial work on one day to claim a per diem. May I have a motion? Uh, I, I, I so move. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have I a Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I thought you were seconding, but um, I couldn't quite tell. Uh, Mr. Joseph Pinero, could we please have the roll call vote? Certainly. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, so, Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Ms. De La Torre, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. Sierra, aye. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mr. Thompson, yes. And Chairperson Urban? Yes. Yes. The vote is 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. The motion carries, and we will proceed um, uh, according to what we have agreed. Um, we do have one final um, uh, item from the start of administration subcommittee, uh, which is simply the board's uh, request for um, the board's sense of whether our um, plan for prioritizing board level policies um, is the same as the board so, and or if the board would prefer us to um, uh, to revise our approach and um, uh, do something else um, between this meeting and the next meeting. Um, so as we mentioned at the top of the meeting, uh, we have been pri prioritizing what we think we need to get done um, uh, right away with the understanding that we do have a fair number of policies we will need to be considering. Um, we recommend, um, first of all, that we continue that approach uh, rather than trying to flesh out all the policies that are in the handbook and any others we might need. Secondly, we recommend um, for the next priority, the development of an incompatible activity statement. Um, and I will turn it over to Ms. Sierra um, it, for any detail that she would like to offer on that. Thank you. Um, so just briefly, the reason that we are recommending that this be the next policy that our committee work on, um, this what is called the incompatibility statement, it is something that is required by state law under the government code. It requires all state agencies to adopt one. Um, these are basically policies that notify employees that certain types of activities and outside employment may be incompatible with their duties as state employees. And, you know, examples from the statute, the statute itself lays out a number of uh, provisions that must be included. For example, what would be prohibited would include misuse of prestige and influence of your office. Um, it would be prohibited to misuse state time and resources. Um, but that list is not exclusive. Um, agencies can add additional items based on the mission of their agency in our subject matter area. Um, for example, we, in developing a proposed policy for your consideration, may want to identify certain types of outside employment that the board would determine is incompatible um, for an individual who's employed by our agency to also be doing, for example, part-time. Um, there is a process um, that an agency must pursue in adopting this type of um, statement. And um, what it involves is a public, a 30 day publication and comment period. And then the policy needs to be approved by the California Department of Human Resources. Um, all employees upon starting with our agency would um, need to review and sign once we have a finally final and approved policy. Uh, but before we did any publication um, and started that process, we would come to the board with the proposed policy. Um, you know, our aim would be to, to present it to you at our next board meeting. And we'd also want to be exploring with you um, whether we should be extending some or all of these provisions to us as board members, and um, that would be through a conflict of interest policy, because um, the incompatibility stu statement only pertains to the actual employees. So that is our proposal um, with respect to the next policy for us to work on and to present to you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Uh, I would add that uh, we have um, sought advice from the California Attorney General's Office, um, and they are providing uh, example policy um, to get us started and background information 
that we can provide to the board um, when we are ready. Uh, is there a comment on this as the um, next um, priority, uh, whether we should have additional or other priorities? Uh, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I just want to agree with that priority. I think that you should go ahead and, and prepare that. Um, my initial um, feedback on the idea of having that policy apply to board members is that it doesn't quite make a lot of sense to me, but I haven't really taken the time to think it through. And um, the reason why is because the statute itself sets a, a number of um, limitations on us that we have to consider and the staff doesn't necessarily have to consider. And also, I do believe that there is already a conflict of interest policy that we approved prior uh, to now, and it's, it's going through public comments. So I, I, I'm assuming that that will be like a separate track, but um, please go ahead with um, the work that you're suggesting. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I would also note that Mr. Thompson and I have signed an incompatible activity statement um, as part of our, we were appointed by the governor and that's um, uh, something that uh, is part of that process. Um, so we would have to be sure that everything is compatible. Um, any further comment? Thank you, Ms. De La Torre for the thoughts. Um, is there any public comment? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. As a reminder, if anyone would like to make a public comment, uh, this would be the time to raise your hand in your meeting window uh, or press star nine on your telephone. I, I am not seeing any public comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. Um, for completeness, I was just going to share the last slide, which is end of presentation. Um, I thank all of the board members for their time and attention. Um, Mr. Thompson, do you have a final thought? Yeah, sorry. I didn't know if, if your request for board member comments was about the incompatible activity statement or, or future priorities for the subcommittee. So I, I had a uh -huh. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to bring to the attention of the board that she's projected her full screen and she's probably not intending to do that. Oh, I'm um, sorry. What was I showing? Yes. <laughs> I was that what was I showing? I don't know. There were documents. Oh, I didn't several read. different documents. Oh my goodness. I do off now. No, my attention was to show the slide. <laughs> Good. Um Is that better. There you go. Okay. Um, I think the incompatible activities policy makes, makes sense for the subcommittee to work on. I didn't know how we're going to start to flesh out what, how we are thinking of the operating model of the, of the agency, kind of what the concept of our operations are, our, our goals and the capabilities that we need to achieve those goals and, and what structure. Um, Obviously, some of those things will be within the purview of the executive leadership of the agency when it comes on board. But th these strike me as things we might want to get a head start on, utilizing the capabilities of the of the subcommittee. Um, and they will be things I think the board probably has an opinion on. Uh, so I didn't know if that how we were planning on on addressing those bigger picture questions. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, are you referring to um, something like a plan that Mr. Lay brought up last time, something like an organizational chart, both? I, I think they, they work together. A strategic plan for what we need to achieve will spell out uh, long-term and, and medium-term goals. Um, and then we need to start to identify what capabilities we will need as an organization and then what structure we want to put those capabilities into. Um, that seems like a fair amount of work that will take a while. Uh, and we'll, it'll need the inputs and assistance of folks other than, than probably the two subcommittee members and, and the staff we have on board. Um, no knock on the, on the immense and amazing capabilities of our two subcommittee members, but um, I, I want to make sure we're, we're, we're keeping our eye on, on the longer term development of the agency as, as well, um, both the short term and the longer term needs. 
Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, the subcommittee will take that under advisement. Um, and um, the uh, I will say from my part that um, one hope that I have is that we will be able to hire an executive director soon and we can all work together um, on, on these um, vision, the vision of the structure of the agency and where it's going. Um, but your point is very well taken that, you know, this isn't something we can put off, of course. Any further comments? Thank you very much. Um, that concludes uh, agenda item four. Um, I propose that we take a 30 minute lunch break at this point and come back with agenda item five. Um, we, um, we do have still a fair amount of uh, work to get through um, and we will need to go into closed session um, sort of mid afternoon um, if we can. Um, so uh, I do apologize, it's a relatively short break. Um, that is my thinking. Uh, Ms. De La Torre. I, I will suggest if everybody agrees that we make the break shorter, even 15 minutes if, if everybody agrees, um, because like you mentioned, we have a fair amount to cover. Um, that is perfectly fine with me. Um, uh, sometimes people need to do things, to eat or whatever. Um, it's all right with me. Um, do other board members have opinions? I'd, I'd like at least 20 minutes. Okay, Ms. Sierra. Either is fine. I don't need okay. to. All right, shall we say 20 minutes? Wonderful. Um, thank you all very much. Um, we are in recess at 12.05 p.m. We will return at 12.25 p.m. Thanks to everyone um, uh, on uh, from the public um, for listening in and engaging with us. And thank you to the board members. I will see you in 20 minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone um, for returning. It's 12.25 and we will return from recess now and reopen the meeting. Uh, we will proceed with agenda item number five, which is um, an update from the regulations subcommittee. Um, the regulations subcommittee, as a reminder, was formed to advise on the board, the agencies, excuse me, upcoming rulemaking and it's comprised of Ms. De La Torre um, and myself. Um, so um, I will uh, be sharing our presentation. Um, for those of you um, in the public, um, just check the website. The materials are available on the website. Yes, I know. They're numbered. I was. I was going to direct um, people to the correct numbers. Um, this is uh, starting with part three um, and our presentation is part five. Is the regulation subcommittee presentation up on the screen? Great, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, so Ms. De La Torre and I um, comprise the regulation subcommittee. We're going to give a very brief update on our activities and um, recommend an initial course of action uh, to the board. Um, so to begin, um, I'm going to do a very brief overview of the rulemaking process just to orient the discussion. We had a longer training on this in our June 14th meeting. The important thing uh, to recognize is that there are two main components um, to rulemaking. The first is preliminary activities. Agencies are able to conduct preliminary information gathering 
uh, activities to gather information in whatever way is most productive. Um, so that might be requesting comments from the public, uh, written comments on the public. It might be informational workshops or hearings. Um, and uh, there's a wide range of uh, activities an agency can undertake in order to gather information in this preliminary fashion. Second, there is the formal rulemaking process. Um, the formal rulemaking record is opened with the publication of the agency's um, initial version of regulations uh, with a notice of proposed rulemaking and what's called an initial statement of reasons. Um, the, uh, that process then uh, follows a strict timeline that includes, again, collecting public comments, holding hearings, and responding to comments. Um, so this is the sort of basic, basic overview just to orient the discussion. I will also give a brief um, status update. Uh, the regulations subcommittee has reviewed statutory requirements, timelines, available resources, and process options. Based on this information, we've come up with an advised initial course of action. We've secured certain resources, um, for example, some technical support for accepting public comments. We are working toward uh, personnel resources. Um, uh, this is, uh, within our subcommittee, we've been focused on one stream because we have to maintain our separation between subcommittees under Bagley King. So I will first refer back to the chairperson's update and the startup and administration subcommittee um, to remind everyone that um, uh, staffing support, attorney support from retired annuitants and also uh, any civil service positions we could fill or interagency agreements we can make is very much on the table and being pursued. Um, in addition, um, uh, this subcommittee has um, uh, followed up on the um, on the requirement in the statute for the Office of the Attorney General to provide support. I formally requested staffing support from the Office of the Attorney General for rulemaking activities, including staff and resources for informational hearings. Uh, the Attorney General's Office and we, uh, the Regulation Subcommittee, um, have a meeting coming up um, soon to discuss this further with the um, Office of the Attorney General. Um, and um, we will, of course, report uh, what we are able to um, work out with them um, uh, in, in the next meeting. Um, I will now hand the presentation over to Ms. De La Torre, who will outline our findings and the initial course of action that we are advising the board to take. You're on mute, Ms. Apologies, I, I was on mute. Um, so you might want to move to the next person. Yeah. So before we go into the details in that slide, I also wanted to um, remind um, the board of the conversations we had and how we interpret those conversations in terms of the goals that we set for ourselves uh, while preparing this proposal. So our goals, um, and I, we understand those were the priorities outlined by the board on June 14th, uh, were to, first of all, accelerate the rulemaking process while ensuring transparency, accountability, and compliance with our requirements, which include a Bagley King. We aim at, at structuring the work so that all members of the board uh, were able to participate in the rulemaking process in a meaningful way. We aim at aligning uh, the assignments of work with what we understand to be the skills and expertise that each one of us brings to the board. We also try to distribute the work as evenly as possible. This was very challenging because given the requirements that apply to us, the um, subcommittees that we are proposing have to really work independently, meaning they cannot communicate with each other so that, mean, uh, that meant to us, when we distributed the work, that um, the piece of work assigned to each subcommittee had to be basically independent or sufficiently isolated from the other 
chunks of work assigned to the different subcommittees to enable that compliance with back breaking. And um, I think that there's one subcommittee that actually has possibly a, 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 a higher burden in terms of the assignment, but we just couldn't find a way to, to avoid that. Um, we also wanted to ensure that we were able to solicit broad public participation immediately to gather input from the public as soon as possible before even starting to draft our initial version of the rules. In order to enable the public to provide minimal, meaningful and impactful comments, we aim at identifying the different areas where feedback was most needed and provide tools and tips to help the public file these comments in an effective way. The high level approach that we followed to that idea of soliciting um, public comments that were more needed was to highlight for the public those topics that are completely new because they don't exist under CCPA or those areas of CCPA that have been substantially changed. There is a substantial record already in place that was generated by the Attorney General when they went through the CCPA rulemaking process. And we can benefit from that public record in terms of understanding the feedback of the public. So we felt that the new areas were more important in terms of us understanding um, what are the preferences of um, the, um, the public. Finally, we wanted to ensure that uh, subcommittees were able to gather information they needed and call on experts or interested parties during public informational gathering meetings before we um, draft the initial version of the rules. This will give us more flexibility and enable the kinds of conversations that we might wanna engage in so that um, we are um, well informed before we uh, put together the first um, drafting of the rules. In terms of challenges uh, and strategy, so one big challenge was the ensuring compliance with back leaking uh, because that required us to create cell committees that could function independently without sharing information. To address this challenge, what we have done is we separated the work of the subcommittees into new rulemaking, update of existing rules, and then a subcommittee that is essential that deals with the process of rulemaking. Um, and we will talk a little bit more in detail about this, and we're happy to also answer any questions that the members of the board might have. One of the challenges is that when we review the rulemaking, um, the, the sections of the study that talk about rulemaking, and there are several sections, some of them are, are not necessarily where you will expect them to, to be. But um, when we review those sections, we identified that there were areas where there is a mandate to issue rules, but there are also areas where we are enabled to issue rules and we have to account for conversations within the board to consider those areas and determine which ones of those areas that are allowable we want to um, engage in versus um, which are the ones where maybe it's not the right time to um, start a rulemaking process. The other challenges, uh, challenge that we face is the volume of work ahead. I think this was highlighted in the prior meeting, but it is expected that the Current rules uh, are basically one third of the final rules that we will have. So we are gonna increase the volume of what are already substantial rules uh, potentially by two thirds, that's a lot of work. Uh, we look for ways to maximize efficiency to deal with this volume of work. One of the strategies that we use for this is for example, thinking about using existing records of public comments and responses gathered as opposed to generating necessarily a new record on the same on the same topics if it was not needed. Um, so basically what I'm saying in, in a nutshell is we want to um, maximize the great work that the AG put together and benefit from that um, as much as possible. In terms of work distribution, uh, we did ensure that after um, you know, if our proposal is approved, that all members of the board will be 
serving in two different subcommittees. Um, and I think that in a way that will even itself out some subcommittees, I think are gonna have maybe a heavier load, uh, particularly at the beginning of the rulemaking process. But like I said, it was really difficult to, to avoid that. Um, in terms of public participation, uh, we try to um, tackle that challenge. And, and I'm looking forward to the presentation of the third subcommittee because you know, with the limitations that we have in, in meetings and gatherings and the situation with COVID, it's, it's really difficult to, to think about different venues to enable this public participation. But one thing that we did is we tried to, in our um, request for, um, uh, for comments, First of all, don't not use legalese and outline the topics in, in a logical manner, in as clear language as we could, you know, move all of those citations to footnotes so that, you know, regular people can read them and understand and decide what are the topics that are of most interest to them um, and it, it, the document can be accessible. We also decided uh, that it might be helpful to create uh, this a tips um, document for the members of the public to to understand how they can best um, draft effective comments. So the proposed action course is, is right here summarized. That the first thing is we will ask the board to authorize the immediate commencement of pre-rulemaking activities. This means that we would like to issue an invitation for comments. And we will also like to start working in identifying topics for informational hearings um, we, ha we have a, a, another slide that um, talks about suggesting topics. The second main point is that we are asking the board to approve the creation of three additional subcommittees. The first subcommittee will take over adapting and basically redlining the existing CCPA rules to align them with CPRA requirements. The second subcommittee will take over creating basically rules from a scratch. These are for topics that are not addressed currently in CCPA and therefore they are not in the CCPA rules. This subcommittee basically doesn't have a record to refer back to because it's gonna be dealing with new items. The third subcommittee is the rulemaking process of committee. And that subcommittee will be responsible for helping us get through the rulemaking process. One of the initial uh, things that we anticipate we will be doing if the proposal is approved is to start informational hearings. The rulemaking process of committee will take the input from the other subcommittees in terms of the topics, and then will work independently to enable us to put together um, a good um, um, a, a panels that include the expertise that is um, desired or required in order to provide the feedback that the um, C CPA rule update subcommittee and the new CPRA rule subcommittee um, deem necessary. As a note, we also propose that the current regulation subcommittee will dissolve September 17, I will miss Jennifer very much. <laughs> I'm not gonna get to talk with her every day, but um, we need a little extra time. The reason we don't wanna dissolve it immediately is because like Jennifer mentioned, we have a conversation already scheduled that needs to take place. And also, I don't think it's mentioned on the slides, but um, both of us have signed up for rulemaking school, which is a three-day um, commitment. Uh, and. Typically, you know, if we had a general counsel, the general counsel should go <laughs> to a school, but since we don't, uh, we, we're gonna put ourselves through school so that we better understand the process and are uh, able to, to, to guide um, the subcommittees um, and ensure that we comply with it. In terms of hiring staff, we have the, the bullet point there, but I really would like to refer you to the discussion that we already had. Um, uh, we're hoping, that um, at least my personal hope is that the uh, conversation with the AG will result in some form of immediate support for these subcommittees, maybe um, an attorney part-time, but we cannot promise that the conversation is 
is still to be had that um, we're, we're uh, aiming at having one person at least support each one of these subcommittees, even if it's in, uh, on part-time basis. Um, do we move to the next slide? And Jennifer, is there something else? Okay, so in terms of the proposed subdivision of work, I want to say that um, you know, I, I actually, I love being an attorney. I love reading laws and I am good at puzzles, but this was, this looks so easy, but it was so difficult. And I will really encourage the, the, the members of the board to look at the supplementary materials because those are the ones that actually for each one of these um, subcommittees identify the subsection of the law, uh, the topic, uh, and a summary of the topic that's assigned um, to each subcommittee. But at a high level, what we're talking about uh, is that the new CPA rules subcommittee will deal with cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, automated decision-making, and then the agency audit authority. These are the things that are not in the current CCPA rules. We are proposing that a member, they and, and myself will serve in that subcommittee, but obviously we're open to feedback from the other members of the board. Um, like I mentioned initially, we try to align um, the expertise of the different members of the board with the assignments the best that we that's the best that we could. The second subcommittee will be the update of CCPA rules subcommittee. And that is a really short list. <laughs> I mean, the, the list is really long in reality when you look at the, at the supplemental materials. So everything that has to do with just changing the system rules, including the opt-out requirements and the um, preference signal, accessibility, um, there's a new right, which is, uh, which is the right to correct. That, that was something that the um, update of CC, CCPA rules subcommittee will um, handle as well. And we are proposing that uh, Chair Urban and Member Sierra will serve in that subcommittee. The last subcommittee, which is an essential subcommittee, will actually help coordinate the pre-rulemaking and rulemaking activities. This means the informational hearings, collection of documents, et cetera. It also has to make recommendations on the topic of whether we need to issue rules um, in regards to insurance companies. There is a section of um, CPRA that states that we need to look into how insurance companies are regulated currently and, and see if there is a gap uh, between that regulation and what um, CPRA um, provides. And, if there is a gap, we need to issue rules, but that starts with a process of just obtaining a legal opinion. So the rulemaking process will help us with that. And um, you can see there other tasks. I um, will serve in that committee if the proposal is approved together with member Thompson. Do we wanna to move to the next slide? Right, so the invitation for comments it's actually drafted. Um, it has been provided, I think, a week ago for um, the members to, to take a look at. Um, it aligns with what I was just mentioning, where we're really highlighting in the same order the new things and the things that have substantially changed. And we're trying to use accessible language. Um, in terms of informational hearings, we might want to move to the next slide, uh, Jennifer. In terms of informational hearings, we have here a list of suggested topics. This is just things that we came up with. Um, they're, you know, in the same in the same mind frame that we just mentioned. They are either uh, things that are new or things that are substantially changing. But our expectation is that if the if our proposal is approved, the subcommittees start meeting and they will come to the next board meeting prepared to give us a. Uh, a list of what are the topics that they deem more important in terms of uh, conducting these informational hearings. Uh, we wish we had time for infinite number of informational hearings, but being realistic, I think that we might be able to do three or four. So we're gonna have to be very strategic in terms of selecting um, the topics that are more, more uh, needed. Um, I don't know if there's anything more. Is there anything more, Jennifer, that I'm missing? 
Thank you, um, Ms. De La Torre. Um, this, thank you for the thorough description. I would um, only add that with regard to the, the um, invitation for comments, uh, we, uh, the subcommittee, um, has um, secured resources um, to issue that and to accept comments. Um, things are still being built, but they are very close. Um, and we would like to issue that as soon as possible. Um, in order to give the public uh, time to absorb it and respond to the comments. Uh, we propose a 45-day comment period um, after some research, um, uh, and uh, we uh, mainly would, would like to be able to go to the public um, and start to receive information from them. Perhaps we can move to the next slide, which is just a summary with this graphic uh, representation of the rulemaking process. I find the graphic representation very helpful. Um, and, and, then, right, and then we maybe we can open it for comments by other members of the board and feedback. All right, so this is a summary of recommendations. We have some draft timelines in here. Um, understanding that the subcommittees are going to be reporting and of course the process subcommittee um, will um, have a critical responsibility here, uh, but we were trying to count back um, uh, and figure out sort of what some rough timelines are. Um, that is the end of the presentation. I will stop sharing it, um, but we can bring it back up again, should anybody like. And One thing that I was going to mention, Jennifer, I know member um, Thomas asked for an uh, overview of what the AG had needed in terms of resources. And I actually found my notes on that. So I'm happy to read from those if, if that is um, helpful. Um, I think a, a rough estimate um, would be appropriate. Um, we don't have an, we don't have details. Right. I, right, we don't have details. And to be honest, I think that um, we will need more resources than the AG for two reasons. Number one is we have more rules. But number two is our process is more complex because we operate as a committee. So everything is gonna to have to come for approval. They, didn't, they really didn't have to go through those steps. Um, but one thing that I can share from what uh, the AG shared with us is that it is clear to us that they, the, the need for resources increased over time. Meaning the preliminary activities might need just one full-time person and some support versus at the end when you're talking about assembling the final rulemaking package and obtaining approval, we might, if we are in a position to do so, have several attorneys or legally trained staff engaged in helping us do that. And the initial drafting and the creation of the uh, NOPA uh, that also will be a point where we will start needing more um, staff. We were advised to look for perhaps software solutions that help us track comments. Um, we are apparently there is no like off the shelf package that we <laughs> that we can buy to do this, but it is really really involved because every comment that is filed, we're going to have to identify. Um, which pieces go to which rules and answer each comment. Not if we have the same comment made by multiple people, we don't have to answer it multiple times. But we really, that, that just requires a lot of very detailed work, reviewing and creating this, this packet. And the last thing that I wanna remind everybody, which the AG also reminded us is that we are not the only agency that is involved in the rulemaking process. We cannot necessarily anticipate the time that other agencies that will need to provide approvals or participate in the process may need. Uh, so we are hoping to have the public understand that that's, that's the case, that we, are, we, we don't fully control the timeline here. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, comments and questions from board members on our proposed course of action for um, any of the documents. Mr. Lay. Yeah, I appreciate the work um, you all have done on this. Um, you know, <clears throat> I, I think the recommendation is to do a, a rulemaking pretty quickly, but 
I think, and, and part of it is, uh, I believe it says that um, we would have the text of regulations ready by, by winter. Um, I, I just don't think that's that feasible. Uh, we can have some, in, in, my, in my opinion, what, what makes, makes more sense is kind of what the CPUC does, right? Um, there's an initial scoping memo that talks about all of the issues that need to be talked about, um, you know, and then there's preliminary thoughts in that scoping memo that you get comment on. So there's actually a specific list of questions. So for example, um, I, I'm assigned to the cybersecurity audit committee. The initial regulation or the initial comment period would talk about, okay, what should be in the scope uh, of an audit and what are the processes in which to ensure that the audit is thorough and independent staff a, or the subcommittee would put some ideas out there, but we wouldn't have actual language of the regulation yet, because uh, that wouldn't have us creating from whole cloth, at least for our, the, the new rules, just brand new rules that we don't actually have anybody's thoughts on. And then after we get those comments, you know, they're all arranged by question. Then staff comes in, they, they draft proposed rules. And then there's a proposed decision that comes out and then you get comments on that exact, on the exact language of the, the, the proposed regulations. And then there's a final decision. So I think there has to be at least two, two rulemakings, at least for the, uh, the new rules subcommittee so that we have some material to work with in, in creating these new regulations. Thank you, Mr. Lay. So um, would you advise that the subcommittees prepare the scoping information for each of their topics. Um, and, and forgive me, um, uh, we, we are going to roll school next week, um, but is the CPUC process, um, I mean, I like this, I like the substance of the idea, is the CPUC process um, a formalized process like um, the final rules or is it, a, is it something that falls under the guise of preliminary activities? Yeah, it, it's, it's a pretty, um, and, and Chris, you may have some thoughts on this. Yeah, it's a pretty well-defined process. Um, it's all in the rules of practice and procedure for the CPUC, 30-day comment period, 15-day reply period, or 10-day, I believe, and then there's administrative law judges. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty, uh, I don't want, I don't want to say we got to adopt the whole thing, um, but I think the, the idea of having these phased comment periods to create the record, to create the regulations, uh, makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Ms. Ms. De La Torre. I was going to mention that one thing that comes to mind is that we might want, I mean, the idea that Jennifer and I really had was to leave some of these details to be defined by the subcommittees independently. The, the process, we, we have a process that we have to follow because it's, it's mandated by statute. We, we're going to have to follow that for all of the rules. But the idea, for example, of generating a memo and getting that uh, initial feedback might be really, really helpful for the new rules subcommittee, but might have less impact in terms of the work of the CCPA updates subcommittee. So I, my suggestion is that whatever decision is taken in terms of the things that are not mandatory should be left to the subcommittees to, to design so that the process is designed in a way that better serves their needs. I would add that um, we very much recognize how aggressive the schedule is. Um, it is, was produced, the draft, I mean, the sort of rough timeline, it was produced by counting back from our statutory deadline. Um, and um, we can certainly explore options um, uh, for managing that, um, but that's, that's where that's where the sort of rough timeline came from. There's a process with the Office of Administrative Law um, that takes a certain amount of time, um, and there are all the required parts of the uh, formal rulemaking process. Um, we also have to um, give our notice um, that we will be taking on authority to pass the rules uh, to the Attorney General, um, but we don't have to do that quite uh, yet, um, we will just have to consider it pretty quickly. Um, other comments and thoughts from the board members? Yes, Mr. Lay. 
Uh, yeah, I hate to ask this, but you know, is there any way to push back that, that pretty concrete sounding deadline of July 1st, 2022? Um, yeah, because it makes sense counting back, having two 45 day rulemakings um, is going to be tough. And uh, just without staff to draft the regulations, this is, uh, is going to be really difficult. Thank you, Mr. Lake. Um, the, the, there are options. Um, one option would be um, to request that the legislature uh, revise the deadline. Anything the legislature does would have to comport with the purposes of the statute, um, essentially to protect Californians' privacy. I know you know this, Mr. Lay. I'm just finishing the whole thought all the way through. Um, there is another option. Um, which is the legislature does designate some regulations as what are called emergency regulations. Emergency regulations follow a slightly different timeline. Um, they go to the Office of Administrative Law on a very short timeline and then go into effect. Um, and when then they go into effect provisionally um, and then the formalized process uh, continues. So they're sort of temporary regulations. Um, there's, there, it's also completely allowed um, to do all of the preliminary information gathering um, in order to have high, you know, high quality regulations, but it changes the timeline to some degree. Um, there are obviously trade-offs. Um, there's, um, there's uh, the there's the the question of what it would mean um, to have the sort of emergency temporary regulations. Um, we could address that, of course, to some degree by making sure that we really have input um, in advance. Um, there are also other timelines um, in the statute or other deadlines. For example, when the regulations take effect and consumers and businesses need to follow them and enforcement. Um, so all of that would have to be taken into account. But those are two um, potential um, options in addition to um, what uh, Ms. De La Torre and I um, are proposing um, to meet the existing deadline. I, I just wanted to, to mention that, um, you know, from my point of view, I think it's also important to consider that we have to allow time for the organizations that are gonna be subject to these rules to actually implement the mandate. And the, um, you know, the, there's these alternatives that uh, the chair just highlighted that really required us to have a conversation with Sacramento and change the law. But from my point of view, there are more simple solutions uh, that we could consider if we are not able to have final rules by the deadline, we could consider giving a grace period for enforcement, which will enable the organizations that are gonna to have to comply with this to have some time where they can adapt their practices to the requirements and while being confident that they are not gonna be subject to enforcement um, when they didn't really have a realistic kind of ramp up period to, to um, implement the requirements. Um, so that is a more, that, that's completely on our agency to decide as a policy, as opposed to a solution that will require us to go to Sacramento and implement a legislative change. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Um, I just amplify the point of the, the nested or the, the, sorry, not nested, but subsequent deadlines, which um, are all connected. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Chairperson Urban, and, and thank you to both of you for it. This presentation is well thought out, well laid out, and, and good, really good work. So I appreciate how much effort and clarity of thought uh, is, is demonstrated here. Um, you know, I think a lot of your proposed course of action makes sense. The subcommittees make sense. Um, I have a couple of, a couple of thoughts and a couple of questions. Um, 
I think, and they are uh, similar to what uh, board member Lay said, you know, us looking at options on the deadline, because I'm, I'm concerned that we are need to, we're, we're gonna hit a fork in the road and need to make a decision on, on how we're proceeding there. Um, the attorney general staffing level was alluded to, but I'm not sure that um, kind of where we landed on that, that discussion um, is what I heard was we're gonna need more than they had or have. Um, I don't know what they have. Um, and then what's it gonna to take to, for us to get to more than they have um, right. in terms of time? Um, you mentioned the rules school, um, and I, I have a question on whether or not all of us should go, uh, and whether or not we can all go uh, to the same thing under Bagley. Can we have a quorum <laughs> attending the same class? Um, uh, I think the, the last bit, just because it's quick, if, if any, anybody who wants to go to rules school, very much encouraged, we can only go in pairs um, in our service. <laughs> um, and they, they do offer it. With, I think they offer, so, but um, but uh, what, if we can work it out and there is appetite from members to go to rural school, it's definitely encouraged. Okay. Well, it definitely makes sense for it to be forbidden for all of us to learn simultaneously. That would be, could we have an informational hearing <laughs> with the rural <laughs> school presenters? We, we could, we could do a publicly noticed um, meeting um, if, if they were able to do it. They have a schedule. Uh, it's a very, um, efficiently run organization with not very many staff. So they have a, they have a sort of a sequence that they, that they follow and school that they offer when they offer it. Um, but I think, you know, we can explore various options. Right. And I believe that once we are able to onboard the general counsel, this should mm -hmm. be something to consider if the general counsel doesn't, I mean, we might be lucky enough to onboard the general counsel that doesn't need that kind of training, but, um, we really need somebody to ask questions from more than, you know, having the information ourselves. It might be more efficient, um, but definitely um, we can, we will report back in the next meeting about the experience. It's a three day commitment, but um, anybody who wants to participate in it should, should be welcome to do so. Um, yes, they do have to accept you. There's a process that we can, um, and we've heard great things about it. So, you know, so if everybody has, for example, Deborah's email, and I believe we all do, maybe it would be a good idea to just, uh, any board member that thinks that they would be interested, just send her an email to let her know and we can work from there, Jennifer. Yes, please do send an email to Ms. Castanon so um, she can track the, lo the logistics. Um, I'm sorry, who is administered by whom? The rules school? The office, the office of Administrative Law. Okay. Um, which is the regulating agency that regulates our regulatory process. Um, they, they will have to approve our final version of the rules if we're, um, they go into force. Yeah. Right. And they also have some good information on their website um, that it isn't the concentrated rules rule. Okay. And so it's three days, it uses three full days? Three full days. Mm -hmm. So more than six hours. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think it is. I think it's like <laughs> goes to five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, right. Now, Mr. Thompson, um, I, I thought that was going to be quick, so mm -hmm. I apologize. Did you have more um, that you wanted to cover? Uh, yeah, the, well, and what Vincent mentioned about the CPUC process, you know, I think this is something that the process subcommittee can look at, but it bleeds into the earlier comment about our organizational model and how we're thinking about things, mm -hmm. because those are well, well documented and well established processes. Um, both for their investigations and their rulemakings that, that we should That's learn good. more about. Um, and I, you know, happy to take that up in the subcommittee with, with some recommendations from what that agency and other agencies do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that also will start to influence our structure. Um, Cause I, I do think there are some advantages to th that commission structure and, and how they, how they operate. And they are, they, there are some similarities in their administrative law and enforcement functions and their policy making functions. Um, so I thought that point was was well made. So, I, so to go back to one is the AG staffing level. Um, was there something on the number of and types of folks that could be shared in, in this meeting for our information? Because that, right. that then flows into the point about the deadline for rulemaking. We, we do have exact numbers. Um, 
the the range is uh, approximately ten. Uh, towards the end of the process. At the towards the end of the process, um, some uh, that was um, people working pretty much full time. You know, there's part people are um, devoting some portion of their time at various levels. Um, uh, the Attorney General's Office, of course, also has a full panoply of support services and technical services and all of those things, which is not to say we won't have those things, we're working hard to have those things. It's only to say that we do have to keep in mind the, um, the dual uh, building the plane as we go down, we're building, this, right. we're building the capacity while we're, um, while we're creating the rules. Um, so, uh, you know, if, for example, we're able to hire um, some retired annuitants if they're experienced with rulemaking, they can only work part time. Um, we have to think about how we will be able to build and allocate those resources. Okay. But thank you. That helps just give a sense of so 10 people of whom a certain number were attorneys plus support that was existing in the agency in a way that we don't yet have. So add add some some multiplier for the, the support services that they were getting. Is that a fair way of thinking about it? I think so. it's very approximate. Um, but you know, if we're thinking about are we talking about two people? Are we talking about 20 people? You know, it does give us a kind of a picture. Yeah. Okay. Right. And I think that I was really encouraged by the information shared by the um, a startup um, committee about the possibility of bringing in uh, retired people who are very experienced. Because the one thing that we're going to have to consider is that this is not a permanent need of the agency. This is a need right now because we have to do rulemaking, but those staff positions will have to dedicate their time to something else once we're done with the rulemaking. So it might be an ideal uh, fit for somebody who has the experience and comes for, for a limited time engagement. Thank you, um, Ms. Sierra. Sorry, so, so that- Point that goes, over Mr. Thompson and then- Sorry, my final time. point, which is about the deadline, because um, I had a similar reaction that, that Vincent did, that you know, I look at how much time we have left and I look at what we need to do. Um, and the timeframes for the informational hearings and there was something else in the winter, spring of, um, of 21-22, uh, my back of the envelope from the last meeting was that we needed to have draft rules around January or February of next year to have final rules by July. That might have been a little conservative on my part, but I, I would worry if we're still gathering information in the spring, how we're going to get to final rules in the in by July 1st. Um, and we might want to set a, a deadline for ourselves of when we're going to make a determination. What are the milestones that we need to have hit to feel confident we're going to get to July 1st and have an off ramp if maybe January of 22, we can make a determination as a board. We don't think we're going to make it. So because we have to give the legislature time to act um, and consider a request if that is the, the, the course of action. I don't mean to be negative this far out, but it is a daunting task. No, we need contingency plans. There's no, there's no question. Um, this makes perfect sense to me. Uh, our proposal is to try to start informational hearings ASAP. Um, you know, and then there's just the question of practically how quickly um, yeah. we can do that, and we can do it in an efficient and meaningful way, where we're covering topics that are are topics that will um, provide the most use. Um, That's right. But then that goes back to needing the people to step. Mm, that's right. Need people to staff those hearings and to help us substantively in Correct. the hearings, in addition to administratively. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Sierra. Um, yes. Um, just first of all, I really appreciate all the work that went into this. This is really substantive, and I'm I really um, very very helpful. So thank you. And I think the approach. You know, in this discussion, everything makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, I had more of a logistics question on the informational hearings. Um, are they going to be board hearings that we can all attend, or will be different subcommittees will be 
is convening for different informational hearings? Or is that something that we just don't need to decide? So, so one thing that um, we have during the pre-rulemaking process is a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. So we will encourage the subcommittees to reach out on their own and have conversations with different agencies or different experts that they wanna get um, particular feedback from. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be done without an open hearing. Right. But in addition to that, which we will leave really to the decision of the individual subcommittee, we think it will be helpful to create some kind of public informational hearing. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know, you know, I, I, th and I think realistically we cannot have more than four. So we have to be very strategic about that. The advantage of having those right now before the record opens is that we are gonna have more flexibility in terms of engaging in a conversation. Once the record opens, um, you know, we, we, were at a, we were at a call with um, the AG and one of the AGs mentioned that during the CCP rulemaking process, he was at a baseball game and somebody who was, you know, a friend started to talk to him about the rules and he had to say, you can't talk to me about the rules, you have to file this. So that's the kind of um, transparency that is there for a, for a very good reason, but we're gonna have to account for once the formal process starts. So the, the informational uh, hearings and the informal process should be utilized for, to help the board members form their own mind as to you know, where should we go with the initial version of the rules. Definitely once they're published, we we'll have all of the public comments and that's information that we have to also absorb and uh, use to um, adapt the initial version of the rules as we, as we consider appropriate. But um, I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, no, that is very helpful. And I guess whether the additional part of it is, will we all be able to attend or because of Bagley King, we will only be able to do this in groups of twos? Maybe Jennifer more. probably, um, can answer that better than me. But my understanding is that so long as it's in the agenda um, and it's properly noticed, we could we could all of us attend. Uh, Jennifer, is that correct? That is my understanding. Um, I won't ask Mr. Phillips if he can uh, pause in case he wants to correct us. But my understanding is if it's properly noticed 10 days ahead, um, we can treat it like a public meeting and uh, all board members can attend. Great. Mr. Phillips is nodding. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. For yeah, you're right on. But you can, you can also slice it up different ways. Um, if you wanted to have just a committee hold a hearing, you can do that and not have the formal notice requirements of Bagley Keen as well. As long as you don't have a quorum, you don't have notice requirements. Okay, so we have a lot of flexibility. We do have the constraint of resources for this. Um, so we'll have to keep all of that in mind, um, but we do have flexibility in how we organize it. Thank you. Other comments, um, questions? Yes, Mr. Lay. Yeah, so how, <clears throat> you know, these informational hearings, and we'll talk about it a little bit in uh, our subcommittee uh, report. Um, you know, most of the substantive stuff comes in as uh, written comments. Um, and you, you mentioned about getting a platform. Uh, is, are we just gonna do emails? Like because folks email us or is there any <laughs> plan to get a, um, a platform for, for us to receive comments? Uh, thank you for the question. And I apologize for, again, gauging detail. I gauged, I gauged wrong there. Um, the um, folks at the Department of Consumer Affairs who are um, providing us with IT services are working with Ms. Castanon um, to create the facility on our website um, for us to issue the invitation for comments and for people to respond. Um, that may be via a forum, it may be via an email address like regulations at ccpa.gov, um, but it will be a standard um, uh, approach to having people submit written comments. Thank there you. is a second. Thank you, Mr. Lake. I do want to. I realized, Ms. De La Troy, we did gloss over a little bit what we do when we have the comments. Um, and um, for the sort of full picture for the board, um, 
we, uh, we do have the facility um, to collect the comments. Um, one of the things that we are actively pursuing resources for um, is uh, the ability to redact them because we will want to make them public. Um, and we will um, be, um, I think board members can speak with Ms. Kassan about how they prefer to proceed. Um, if one wants to access them on the um, state, um, in the state repository for security reasons, we do have to use state owned laptops, um, but there's also the possibility for subcommittees to wait um, until the material is redacted and made public. And I think that's really up to the subcommittee. Um, further comments or questions from the board? All right, I would like to um, propose um, two action items for you to think about, and then we will request public comment. Uh, the first action item will be a request for a motion to approve the regulation subcommittee's proposed course of action for preliminary rulemaking activities, including the preliminary information gathering activities we described and the formation of new subcommittees as described in today's presentation. And the second um, item is just to be safe and be sure that the board um, has gone on record um, as uh, approving uh, releasing to the public an invitation for comments substantially in the form of the discussion draft for comments reviewed today and inviting the public to respond with written comments within a 45 day period. And that would as soon as uh, technically feasible. Um, uh, I have added substantially in the form because that document does have discussion draft at the top and it doesn't have, you know, the email. There are some, some little changes that would need to be made. Um, we could also, of course, consider edits. Um, but those are the two I would, uh, um, action items I would like you to have in your minds as we go to public comment. Mr. Evan Panero, um, is there any uh, public comment? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. So if anyone uh, wishes to make a public comment, please press the raised hand on your screen, or if you're connected by phone, you can press star nine. Uh, it looks like we have one additional comment from uh, Yadi. You have three minutes to make your comment. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your hard work. Uh, really excited uh, for you and the agency. Uh, two pieces of suggestions for you is um, uh, maybe collecting feedback from consumers um, in regards to their success in exercising their rights under the current landscape um, to help like inform um, new and existing um, regulations um, and ensuring that, you know, uh, uh, organizations are complying with privacy um, laws, like in the spirit of the law sense. And the other is um, to the extent that's feasibly possible to consider uh, making an option for uh, Spanish speaking folks to engage in this process as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and those um, very um, helpful suggestions. Much appreciated. And it looks like we have uh, one additional comment uh, from uh, Tanya. Hi. Hi, I hope everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Right. Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Forshead. I'm an attorney. Um, I just wanted to note, given the discussion about the possibility of the agency going to the legislature to try to get some sort of an amendment, possibly, I know that's only one of the many things that you're thinking about in terms of timing, um, but I believe, and I'm just throwing it out there in case others have other information just to, to mention it, that um, I think that the current legislative session in California is actually closing this week. Um, I think on the 10th actually, and that presumably then if anything was gonna happen on the legislative front, that that would have to wait until the 2022 legislative session, which I don't think opens until January. So just to sort of throw that out there, um, based on what I know we went through in 2019, when we were many people on all different sides um, working on potential amendments to the CCPA, um, having to sort of work around those legislative um, schedules. I do believe they are closing this week. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for your comment. I'm not seeing any other, any additional comments at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph Pinero, um, and for the comments from our public uh, commentators. Um, uh, I would now like to request a motion um, to approve the regulation subcommittee's proposed course of action for preliminary rulemaking activities, including the preliminary information and gathering activities described in the formation of new subcommittees as described. Um, do I have a motion for this? So moved. I'll thank second. You. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, for moving, and thank you, Mr. Lay, for seconding. Uh, Mr. Joseph Pinero, could you please call the roll call vote? Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. De La Torre? Uh, aye. Ms. De La Torre, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. Sierra, aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson, aye. And Chairperson Urban? Aye. Chairperson Urban, aye. The vote is 5-0. Thank you very much. The motion carries um, and we will um, we will um, enact the plan recommended by the regulation subcommittee. I want to thank all the board members in advance for your work on these subcommittees. I'm really looking forward to um, um, hearing the plans that everyone comes up with and uh, really um, uh, appreciate um, the service. Um, I would now like to request a motion to approve releasing to the public an invitation for comments that is substantially in the form of the discussion draft for comments review today and inviting the public to respond with written comments within a 45 day period as soon as technically feasible. Do I have a motion? I so move. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Ms. Sierra moves. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, I have a motion and a second. Mr. Joseph Pinero, would you please perform the roll call vote? Certainly. Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Ms. De La Torre, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. Sierra, aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson, aye. And Chairperson Urban? Aye. Thank you. The vote is 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. The motion carries. Um, I thank the board for its substantive and efficient discussion of our plan. Um, I uh, would also just like to quickly, um, but very sincerely, thank Ms. De La Torre um, for the work that she's put in on the regulation subcommittee. It's been a joy. Um, as she said, it's been a puzzle. Um, and um, we uh, are grateful to everyone for the work ongoing. Um, I will also miss, miss Ms. De La Torre, um, but appreciate everything that she's done so far and appreciate everything that is to come. Um, with that, um, uh, we um, are at 125. Um, we have the Public Awareness and Guidance Subcommittee update coming up, the Delegation of Authority for Limited Administrative Functions, um, uh, public comments, if there are any for items not on the agenda, um, a discussion of future agenda items, and when appropriate and sensible, we, need, we will need to circle back to the first agenda item um, to discuss our planning um, for meetings and public events. Uh, Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson, are you um, ready to um, do your, okay, wonderful. In that case, um, we will move to agenda item number seven, or excuse me, agenda item mm -hmm. number six, um, a report from the Public Awareness and Guidance Subcommittee. The Public Awareness and Guidance Subcommittee was formed to advise the board on the agency's duties to promote public awareness and provide guidance to consumers and businesses um, set out in Civil Code Section 1798.199.40. Uh, um, the Public Awareness and Guidance Subcommittee is made up of Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson. We thank you for your service and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, well, I wish we had a great set of uh, visual aids like um, the other subcommittees, but uh, we're just going to share some of our recommendations and notes um, in terms of process. You know, uh, between Chris and I, we've talked to business groups, consumer groups, privacy groups, and uh, the attorney general quite a bit to gather kind of some input on the best ways to achieve our responsibilities of, uh, like Chair Urban said, promoting public awareness uh, about rights and responsibilities and providing guidance to 
uh, consumers and businesses about their responsibilities under their title. Um, at a high level, you know, we believe that um, you know, preserving privacy rights as a default through tools like opt-in within the bounds of the CPRA is key. Um, that's a, the greatest way to make sure that you know, consumers uh, know, I mean, have their rights protected. Um, and you know, recognizing that the vast majority of customers take, uh, consumers take the path of you know, least resistance and may, um, may not understand uh, the full scope of their rights. And then the attorney general has recognized this with their work on the user enabled global privacy control uh, and dark patterns. And uh, you know, as an additional note, you know, we find that if people are given a choice in a clear, easy manner, they often choose to exercise their right. Um, you know, Apple for all their recent issues uh, on, on privacy, uh, it's opt-in to tracking default. Um, app tracking transparency has created a situation where 96% of users uh, opt out of uh, tracking across apps. Um, but in terms of actual staff, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Chris to, to uh, talk about kind of our ideas for the agency uh, before coming back to, to myself. Thanks, Vincent. Um, yeah, we, as, as Vincent mentioned, in particular, we, we benchmarked what the Attorney General is doing as far as their uh, public education and outreach function, and um, both as far as the level of staffing, but also uh, what functions they were performing. Um, and so taking that information into account, the, our recommendation would be to have dedicated staff to do this function, uh, one, to two peop one to two positions to provide the, the privacy education and outreach function uh, that would track with the staffing level that the attorney general's office had. Um, this is something that was mentioned in the regulation subcommittee. So it, it was almost um, foreshadowing our report, but the importance of accurately kind of communicating what legal requirements are in plainly understandable language so that consumers and others um, can understand what their rights and obligations are, but in an accessible way that doesn't require um, uh, uh, attorneys or legal expertise to interpret. Um, one of the things that was really critical to the, the way that uh, the Attorney General's office executed this was an interplay between the, the privacy education outreach function and their enforcement and legal operations to ensure that the outreach and education function was not getting too far, was not getting ahead of or binding the enforcement and, and legal teams. So, you know, work that they were, data that they were aggregating, reports that they were putting out, that they were not putting the enforcement folks in a position where they had given guidance to the public or to businesses that had the potential to conflict with enforcement actions down the road. And um, our understanding is they did that quite successfully within the Attorney General's office. Um, there is an observation that the media function was separated in the Attorney General's office, but the integration of the two functions is, is needed because, you know, uh, broadcast and print media are going to be a vital way of getting information into the hands of the public, particularly consumers. So the integration uh, and coordination of those two functions is gonna be important. Uh, and then understanding the, the outreach and public education function, understanding the goals uh, of the executive team in the, in the attorney general's operation, they had access to the ex executive team. So there was kind of clear line of sight between what the goals were um, by the executive leadership so that that could be translated by the public education and outreach team uh, into effective uh, information sharing. One last observation was that there's a, there is a, a great desire by regulated entities to understand what is expected of them and how they reach compliance. Uh, how they achieve compliance. And so there is a desire to have best practice guides that could inform industry and re other regulated entities in their, um, in their compliance efforts, because this is a relatively new area of regulation and not, not a lot of case law to guide their compliance. So that was, that was a piece of feedback that came in quite a bit. Um, in addition to kind of best practice guides for consumers for what they can 
how they can best protect their privacy. Uh, and I think Vincent will, will touch on that uh, a little bit later in the presentation, but those best practice guides for both consumers and business could be a vital piece of work out of this function. Thank you. Could I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you both. Um, two actually clarifying questions. The, the first one, I, I think I understood, but I just want to be clear. Um, Mr. Thompson, when you were talking about um, functions being separated, uh, media and you were you were talking about public awareness on the one hand and guidance on the other. Is that correct? I just want to be sure I have the right picture. I, I think actually no. Uh, we were talking about how in, in the attorney general there was a separate media uh, relations I group see. as opposed to the public education group. Attorney general, uh, well, privacy public education. Attorney general has a lot of different uh, responsibilities within our agency, we're only focusing on privacy, so it doesn't make sense to separate the two. So our privacy and outreach staff, uh, we recommended two, one to two full-time positions, ideally two um, to, uh, to do that work, and they should also handle the, the media relations uh, as opposed to separating those two functions. I understand, so the communications department would be melded. Yes. I understand, thank you very much. Um, and then my second question was, uh, have you explored, um, to, have you sought advice or explored um, any, um, uh, apologies, let me just formulate this properly. Um, what is appropriate to offer in terms of guidance? Um, uh, because my understanding is that in California agencies can sort of restate the law um, and beyond that, we have to do regulations. And I could be being too conservative in my description or not quite understanding it. But my main question is just whether you had embarked on um, doing any research into that question. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, so like, what's the guidance versus like the regulations? Difference, difference between uh, pure description and interpretation. Right, right. Um, yeah, so it, it, we, we understand that the legal requirements aren't very, uh, are a little impenetrable for uh, lay people. Um, so for, for consumers in particular who don't have access to legal teams, um, they, they would kind of need some plain English explanations, uh, plain language explanations, I'm sorry, um, to kind of understand those rights. So the guidance would be in, 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 in many ways interpretations of, of, the, of the regulation. And part of that was recommending that the legal teams work very closely with um, uh, with this the privacy and education staff to make sure that we're not losing any of the substance, so that we bind our enforcement teams when it comes to um, yeah when it comes to enforcing those regulations. Thank you. I apologize for interrupting your flow. No worries. Um, Ms. De La Torre, did you have a point on this? I'm not sure if, if the presentation is uh, is finished. I don't want to interrupt no. it. I think Mr. Lay had more to say. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. But I mean, if you if you had this is our main recommendation is around these two full time uh, employment positions. I don't know if you had any um, questions on that. I'm happy to we're happy to take them now if you'd like. That that makes a lot of sense. I I really appreciate the work that you have done. I um, have a comment, but it's not on that. So maybe you know finalize the presentation and and okay. then I. Can raise it. All right. Um, so beyond that, some other observations that we made, um, and, and uh, Chris already mentioned this, uh, is that, you know, media relations is a primary way to amplify, um, you know, our, our regulations, our best practices, publications, and guidances. So um, having that as part of the um, staff responsibilities is important. Um, and we, we noted that within the Attorney General, most resources go towards enforcement. Um, and as a result, materials may not be updated as much as standards evolve due to the fast paced nature of the privacy field. So this is more a recommendation for the future ED is um, building a process in which uh, when you when new regulations are issued, um, there is kind of a checkpoint where and, and a database perhaps of, of materials that need to be updated. So it's, a, it's getting really in the weeds, but as a process and as a, you know, um, yeah, as a, as a process within the organization, we think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then beyond that, uh, you know, we, we found that partnerships and collaborations with diverse groups of partners, such as, um, 
you know, privacy organizations, IAPP, um, other industry associations, consumer groups are great ways to get feedback and disseminate information. Um, I'll, I'll highlight that Consumer Action and Consumer Federation of America are working on a privacy survey right now, asking Californians if they know their privacy rights, uh, whether they use them or not, and why that is the case. So, you know, in a lot of ways, those organizations are like a force multiplier for getting uh, education and outreach out there. So providing the materials for those organizations to use um, would be a really helpful way to just making it easier for them to uh, take our message and carry it to their constituents. Um, the FTC uh, is a good example of an agency that has, um, has better uh, outreach methods than we've, we've seen from perhaps um, you know, other government agencies. So there's uh, staff write blogs um, to explain to businesses their responsibilities mm -hmm. um, and potential enforcement. Um, there's a, they created a video um, and a one-stop page for consumer resources for consumer privacy. But uh, we'll note that they think that's a good minimum. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we should also work on meeting people where they're at, right? For consumers in particular. So that means working with other platforms. Um, maybe I'm dating myself by saying this, but yeah, like going on YouTube, going on TikTok, Instagram, um, and perhaps outsourcing that to uh, you know third parties that aren't a government agency in some sense, at least exploring that uh, use of those alternative platforms to get the message out to consumers around what their rights are. Um, and just as a bit of data, the FTC video from two years ago explaining uh, what folks' rights are has, has about 6,000 views. Um, and you look up internet privacy on TikTok uh, that explain the same thing. They have, the, the very first result had 29,000 views. The other, the other ways had 1 million views. Um, it was in a succinct and a little bit more engaging perhaps than, um, than government agencies. Um, are in, in providing information. So, uh, and that can also mean Twitter, podcasts, other ways to um, provide this information is something we should explore, uh, whether that creates any conflicts um, and you know, what is the process for us uh, perhaps to outsource that kind of engagement while still having um, you know, oversight to make sure that the content is accurate. Um, and my final two points um, is that we need to, and this is again for the ED, um, is that we need to make sure there's solid communication between the Attorney General and the CPPA to make sure that there are parallel education efforts, you know, that not all the responsibilities are with us. Uh, we need to make sure that there there's, isn't conflicts between uh, what we're saying and what they're saying. Um, and then finally, this is around the informational hearings. Um, as you may know, the Attorney General did a roadshow of sorts. They went to seven cities to get feedback from the public on um, the uh, CCPA. And uh, the, the feedback that we got was this was helpful from a public engagement standpoint, but there was actually very little uh, public feedback during those hearings, right? The majority of the, um, the actual comments were written uh, and in response to, yeah, the written request for comments um, and folks didn't talk very much uh, at those meetings. Um, the recommendation that we heard was to cut that back significantly um, and, and maybe have one to two, um, perhaps three at the most, um, knowing that uh, most folks will be submitting comments uh, in a written manner. And uh, in, if we do do um, informational hearings, I think it's really important that we make sure the public and other stakeholders are in a good position to provide substantive feedback, right? So that's making sure that we're asking specific questions. So as I mentioned earlier with the CPUC, when they do a scoping memo, there's very specific questions that folks are, uh, are asked that will really help uh, agency staff craft the regulations. So we need to really, as in subcommittees and as we do these, uh, these hearings, um, we need to make sure we develop good questions uh, for, for public to comment on that provides us the material that we need to create the regulations. Um, and I believe, I believe that was it. We're happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Lay. Um, your, the clarity um, and substance of your presentation did not suffer from the lack of slides. So um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, thank you very, very much for that. Um, uh, Ms. De La Torre? Uh, actually, my main question was answered already, and it was around 
um, how we will coordinate our efforts with the Attorney General, given that we share enforcement responsibility with them. It's really important, I think, that they are also involved in anything that we do on the education side. I was going to suggest as well, in terms of the question that was raised um, by the chair, which I don't have an answer for in my in my mind, but um, I know that a few years ago when um, you know, we all started using mobile telephones, the California AG put out a very good resource on privacy in the era of mobile, where they use um, the laws that were in place to interpret them in, in, in the context of mobile. And I think that could be a good reference as to the kinds of things that we might be able to do as an agency in compliance with the um, California requirements. The other resource um, that they have put out uh, is a data breach report. I think the last one is from 2016. And they are using basically a summary of all of their enforcement actions to um, derive some advice for organizations on how to put themselves in, in a good situation to um, ensure that the information is secure. So those two resources, I think, are a good kind of um, give us a, an idea of the kind of things that I think the agency will be able to do in, you know, in remaining compliance with the California requirements. Right. Um, yeah, I think to your first point um, around the AG and uh, CPPA um, uh, communication, I think the, the, the feedback that we got is like, this really has to happen on the staff level. Uh, leadership has to make sure that these communication channels are open. Uh, but us as a board have, you know, we, we can only do so much other than to say the ED like, hey, create this communication channel uh, between between these two um, these two agencies. And then uh, to your point about, yeah, creating um, a resource like that, we believe that should definitely be part of the role of the, those two full-time uh, those staffers, right, is creating a one-stop shop where possible. Um, and then... Yeah, just just a, a resource uh, center for other organizations to use as they you know popularize um, and and disseminate information to their constituents. Thank you, Mr. Light. Seeing no other hands at the moment, um, I would like to ask a question. Um, in thinking about sort of traffic flow and traffic control um, for accomplishing some of these really good ideas. I was hoping that if you are prepared to, um, the subcommittee could say a little bit more about these two staff positions, um, characteristics that you're thinking of, could be in broad terms. Um, I just have my mind on looking for classifications um, and uh, I'm wondering if, I, if you could flesh them out a little bit more. Yeah, actually there was a specific role and I wish I, I had it, um, a specific role for at the AG um, that we could probably copy that classification for. I don't have it in front of me right now, um, but they, they, there was one person and then they had an assistant. Those, those were the two roles. Um, and yeah, apologies, never, yeah, never occurred to me to, to actually grab that classification, but there was a specific one. Um, and that, uh, as far as we know, uh, yeah, we could probably just copy that over as, as soon as I find that. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, that, that would be great. <laughs> so um, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, any other questions or comments from the board? Yes, Ms. Sierra. I see if I can copy, oh great. Um, no, this, this um, great ideas and I really love um, the fact of kind of thinking early on. I mean, the beauty of us being able to develop from scratch, even though it is a lot of work, is that we can put these systems in, you know, as part of our infrastructure and really um, so much agree with the, you know, putting the folks that will be working on this outreach and communications to work either within our legal shop and or, you know, working very collaboratively with our legal shop, I agree is key just to make sure like we are being, you know, as accurate as possible. They can also, if they're coordinating on that, they can coordinate with respect to for giving guidance, you know, what are the um, lines that we cannot cross in terms of, you know, is that regulation versus guidance? You know, our legal shop will be able to um, help that team, those two or three folks that we're talking about on those issues as well. So I just, I really like the idea of starting from the beginning with that coordination in mind. 
Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, to the subcommittee, are, are there any things that you would like the board's um, sort of sense of or, or um, anything like that? Or um, was it, is this you know, more an update? And yes, Ms. Yeah, I, um, I, I believe, I think in terms of prioritizing, um, it would be interesting to get the board's perspective on, on the priority for this. You know, I think this uh, may, this could probably wait um, until we get this, these other hires first um, to the extent of, of, you know, your resources and, and putting out job postings and, what, and whatnot. But um, I'd love to get everyone's kind of input on, yeah, prioritization for, for this, this role. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Sierra? Oh, your hand was still up. All right, wonderful, thank you. Uh, thoughts on prioritization, Mr. Thompson? Oh, sorry. I was just going to add to that uh, to echo what what Vincent said. You know, I think the work that the, this work can roll into the work that uh, the process subcommittee is doing. So conveniently, um, I will come into that with some institutional memory of, of this work. But uh, I concur with him that you know I. I don't think this changes the sequencing of our hiring plans, but it's something to factor in as, as we're getting past the executive director uh, and, and general counsel and, and chief deputy for administration hires that um, looking forward uh, to, to kind of the next round of hires uh, is more appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, yes, that um, I was thinking the same thing that some of this informational hearings and things can roll off. Um, uh, this is this is a, a pro forma um, reminder. I know that you you don't need it, but just to say it to be sure to silo things um, under Bradley King. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Um, thank you. One of the things that I was going to suggest, and I I don't know that I have clear feedback to give in terms of priorities. But given the fact that there's so much work to be done, if um, this subcommittee um, considers that the work of this subcommittee might be something that is more long-term than short-term, we might consider um, delegating additional things that are urgent um, just to best utilize um, the, these resources, this subcommittee. And I, I don't have a concrete idea how that could be done. Um, I know um, the chair might have more, you know, visibility over everything that's going on, but perhaps if there is no time-wise, if there is some time that this subcommittee can dedicate to help with things that need to be done in the next three to four months, um, we should consider best utilizing the, the resource. I, I know there is, Backlinking, there's a lot of considerations, but I just wanted to throw out there that we're stretched for resources and we should be wise um, on how we maximize. Yeah, I think in, in terms of what the, the board and subcommittee should do, at most, I would believe is like put out those postings. Um, and we can discuss that at a later, like what those, those that posting should look like after I get that information. But I, I believe, you know, the ED as we recommended that this position be, you know, have good line of sight to the legal uh, team and the ED. So um, ideally they would be the one making um, that choice on who to hire. So we could maybe make it easier for them in the short term by maybe putting a posting out at most. And then beyond that, I think uh, that level of staffing uh, should, should be held by, um, yeah, whoever, whoever runs the agency. Ms. Sierra? Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense because especially once we also have the general counsel and we did identify, I think we were on the same wavelength that this is an area that the general counsel will be um, or, or the legal division will be involved in. And so I think they can take, you know, we can provide all this feedback and thinking and ideas to them and kind of then they can kind of take the next step. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Is there any public comment? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so it looks like we have a couple of public comments in line. Uh, we have a first comment from uh, Ray Kitty. Uh, as a reminder for anyone else who'd like to make a public comment, 
uh, you can press the raised hand icon in your meeting window or press star nine if you're connected by telephone. Uh, so first comment from uh, Ray Kitty. Uh, you have three minutes. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to just express, I know these are very early days, but um, as an information resource for the public, um, you all could do something really amazing. You know, uh, it occurred to me there's a resource, I can't make up the name for this, it's called Colossus, right? Companies have set this up and many companies buy into it. It provides them data about torts and product liability lawsuits. It provides amazingly detailed case data, which is very hard to get for the members of the public. You know, it's theoretically accessible, but hard to get. And so companies can come to a lawsuit and they can decide in this county, with this demographic, with this judge, with this kind of occurrence, how will we win? How, how can we avoid pain? How can we um, do, you know, be held as uh, little non-liable as possible? They have, they have this access to a strategic resource. As far as I know, no one is building that for the public. So I would just suggest, you know, there's a continuum you all could publish the information that's legally required to be published about things that happened, or you could publish, you know, everything you're legally entitled, you know, that it's legally possible for you to publish. That's a continuum. And, you know, I would just encourage you to um, be as uh, uh, forthcoming with information about cases, what things have happened, who's sued who, who's had valid claims, how were things defended, how were things found to be wrong, how were mistakes corrected, and, you know, to put out any information which is public in any way, you know, including case data, any, you know, it's public information, you know, you all can be putting that out too. So I just wanted you to encourage you uh, to, um, you know, step up to that. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all do. Thanks, bye. Thank you. I, I did want to say when I'm looking down, I'm taking notes. Um, I know you can't see my notepad, but I wanted you to know that's where I'm looking. Uh, thank you for the comment. Great. Looks like we have a comment from uh, Barry Weber. Barry, you have three minutes to make your comment. I'll be quicker than that. I've got three quick uh, comments to separate. The first one is on the subject of resourcing for this awareness uh, component. I, I think of it as two different kinds of components. One's a public relations component, and the other one's in a, a training slash awareness component. And it's uh, HR people or recruiters often talk about purple squirrels. It's tough to find uh, purple squirrels, and you might want to have to consider how many people it really takes based upon actual um, skill set. Specifically in the education awareness space, you might want to consider uh, going down the path of, of gamif gamification. So, so there would actually be uptake of understanding. And that takes a different kind of skill set and thought process than PR as an example. The second comment has to do with uh, the aware, uh, general awareness. There's a lot of discussion about consumer awareness. There's discussion about business awareness. But theoretically, um, the, your agency is going to come out with uh, regulations for employees also. And that is, I think, a different audience than consumers and, and, and business. And you might wanna think through what that means from an awareness standpoint. Uh, the third one is that I think that the six of you would make a great TikTok. Thank you would you have to come. do it at a public meeting. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. And then it looks like we have a comment from Barb Lawler. So you have three minutes to make your comment. Hello, my name is Barbara Lawler, and I am the uh, Chief Operating Officer and Senior Strategist for the Information Accountability Foundation, and we're a forward-looking information policy think tank. I'm also a three-time former Chief Privacy Officer, and I wanted to uh, reinforce support for public hearings. I had the opportunity to provide feedback at one of them back in December of 2019, and I think the challenge with public hearings is that they tend to be uh, scheduled around what works for business people to attend and not the actual public. And so I would encourage to use uh, where the statute uh, 
not just this one, but California law requires that public hearings could be held in a virtual manner, just as these meetings are themselves. And I think that would provide more opportunity for comment from a variety of individual citizens, consumer groups, uh, who may not be able to make, for example, a potentially long drive and find parking to uh, attend a public event. Um, and I also agree with everything Barry said in terms of the communication strategy, that it's consumer focused, it's business focused, and education is a different skill set than PR. Thanks. Thank you very much. I see no further public comments at this time. All right, thank you very much for the comments from the public. Um, I do want to do a, a time check. Um, we have uh, delegation of authority, um, public uh, comments that are not on the agenda, meeting items and circling back um, to our first agenda item. I propose we, we circle back and reopen our first agenda item now that we have some pretty solid information about resources and needs. Um, uh, um, and uh, Chairman. And, and um, so I propose that that's our next um, uh, uh, item. And we'll ask Ms. De, uh, recognize Ms. David Roy. Uh, thank you. This goes to uh, my comment, my prior comment, uh, in terms of what else can the subcommittee do. It just occurred to me, I just remember that one of the things that uh, uh, CPRA provides for is that the, um, there's a percentage of the money derived from enforcement that has to be allocated to different initiatives that um, help educate the, the public, et cetera. I do not remember right now from the top of my head what section that is, but maybe this will be a great subcommittee to start thinking about how that will look like. Uh, once we have those resources, uh, how should we you know, create a process where different organizations, uh, maybe different universities, um, uh, different um, uh, educational organizations can um, request those funds and, and what are the priorities that we should have there? Thank you, Ms. Dilatory. You're, you're speaking about the grant making authority of the, with the, privacy, public, the privacy fund, correct? Correct. Yes, thank you. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add the, the role at the California Attorney General was a director of privacy education and policy. Um, that, that helps you out in finding, I, I couldn't find the classification, but uh, that would be the equivalent. Director of privacy education and policy. Wonderful, thank you very right. much. Um, I thank the subcommittee for this terrific work um, and for the clear um, presentation sharing where you are. Um, uh, at this point, um, I would like to move back to the first agenda item, uh, which was the chairperson's report um, as a reminder uh, and recall that item uh, for discussion of, um, of um, resources and needs in terms of uh, meetings and public events. Um, we now have a sense, I hope, um, after all the subcommittees reports of plans that um, the subcommittees are reporting. And we have some information um, about resources and potential resources that we have. Uh, I'd like to remind the um, group that we have um, two board public board meetings scheduled um, after this one currently. Um, in October and in November. Um, we have the option of scheduling additional meetings um, as long as we notice them 10 days in advance. We do have some um, very difficult, simply they're there, um, staffing limitations um, because each meeting requires council, um, Zoom webinar, moderator and those kinds of things. Um, we've discussed a number of different um, interactions with the public over the course of the day so far. Um, and, um, uh, and, I have, um, and so I think we have the information to try to work out um, what, the, um, what the sense of the board is um, and hopefully talk about options a little bit. I wanted to add one detail that I neglected to mention um, during the first agenda item. Um, my apologies. Um, 
And um, the last commenter, Ms. Lawler, um, reminded me of it with her good suggestion to, um, to lean on virtual meetings. There is an order, there's an executive order that currently allows us to meet virtually and comply with Bagley Key. That order expires on September 30th. Um, I, I don't have information um, about whether the order will be extended um, or whether the legislature um, might reform the current requirements for public meetings. Um, we had a previous commenter point out that their session is waning rapidly, um, but there are potentials for um, us to continue to be able to meet virtually while we have a quorum, as long as we meet the other requirements. There's also the potential that we can't. And I just wanted to be sure that everybody was aware of that um, so that we um, had full information as we engage in this discussion. Um, and with that, um, what we have on the table, as I understand it, are at least um, a number of informational hearings or workshops. Um, we've discussed a little bit how many of those might be. Um, regular board meetings in which we take up um, topics um, from uh, uh, re agenda topics and subcommittee reports. Um, we also are working hard, of course, to hire a number of people, some of whom require board approval. Um, and we could include additional meetings to allow us to deliberate on that. They do have to be noticed. Um, we welcome the public. We could spend most of the time in closed session um, for those meetings, however. Um, Ms. Sierra. I apologize, my hand should be down. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, other comment? Yes, uh, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. I am. Um, I'm very concerned about the fact that in the last six months, we have been able to meet only twice, and I do want to first of all acknowledge and appreciate the efforts that the chair has made to get us to meet these two times. Um, all of the work that is on her shoulders, the, the, the um, limitation in terms of resources. But I do believe that even if we commit to meet monthly moving forward, we're gonna put ourselves in a situation where we will not be able to meet deadlines. I am of the opinion that we need to move to a situation where we can meet twice a month. I also would like to discuss how we can support um, the efforts that the chair has been um, making to enable us to have the staff um, to hold a meeting. Um, I'm not sure to what degree the leadership of um, the agency that houses us is, is aware of those constraints and really of the importance of us being able to meet. Um, we have a mandate from the California voters, millions of people <clears throat> voted to enact um, uh, CPRA and to create this board. And, um, we, we have a commitment to them that we have to uphold. So two things, one is I, I would like to have us agree to meet twice a month. I understand that we already have meetings in October and November that are set. I wouldn't wanna disrupt those. We already have secure um, staff for them, but moving forward, I think it will be helpful for us to make a permanent commitment to say, we're gonna meet on the second, and third Tuesday or of the month or whatever dates we decide so that those can be just reserved for us in terms of our time, but also the public will be aware that we will be meeting. I'm not, um, I know that these meetings will have to be allocated to all of the different um, priorities that the chair just highlighted. It's not only public meetings, they can be informational meetings. There are some of those meetings that might have to be 
behind closed doors so that we can conduct interviews. Uh, but again, my main concern is that unless we radically change the cadence of the meetings, it's not gonna be possible for us to, to deliver on, on our commitment. In terms of um, providing support for the efforts of the chair, um, I think that we, we should be able to perhaps reach out to our appointing authorities and, and bring to their attention um, if we have difficulty securing the personnel that we need um, that fact so that they can perhaps provide support. Um, that's just an idea. I am open um, to suggestions that other members might have. But this is a really, really important thing. It is basic. It is basic for the board to be able to function that we need to meet. And I do not think that our prior commitment to meet monthly is going to be sufficient given that we haven't met since. Uh, we basically have skipped two meetings. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll paraphrase to be sure that I understand. Um, um, your proposal um, is that the board commit to meeting um, twice a month, um, starting uh, starting soon. We can we can we can we can talk. Maybe about maybe uh, December, given that we have two months where we already have something to schedule, and with the understanding that you know if if there is a possibility to fit another meeting within the October November framework, we we might want to try for that. Um, but definitely starting in December. Thank you. Um, that, that's helpful. Um, and, um, and this would be for the board to use for meetings like this, um, closed session for hiring and informational hearings. And if I'm, when I'm working that out and listening, I think that um, we may need more um, if we're going to do some informational right. hearings. Okay, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I'd like to open it up for board um, comment. Yes, Ms. Sierra. Thank you. You know, part of me is I'm not opposed to meeting more often. And I think, you know, there are definitely the things that we will need, um, for example, closed sessions more often for hiring issues. But I'm just, I am concerned that we have so much to do in our subcommittees that I would want but I think you know, it, there's a balance between the time being spent on our subcommittee work, which is going to be very substantive, you know, versus time spent in the board meeting. And I'd want to, you know, I'm a little worried that if we're meeting too often, they, our board meetings won't be as productive as they may be if we space them out, you know, at least every four weeks so that each subcommittee will have more to report and have proposals for the board. I, mean, I don't feel as strongly about not meeting, but I am concerned about, you know, we have all limited time and we want to make sure we use it as productively as possible. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, I would clarify that I believe Ms. De La Troy is also encapsulating in there, um, like public, um, excuse me, um, public informational hearings. Um, mm. Thank you for the comment. Um, additional comments? Yes, Mr. Lay, uh, followed by Mr. Thompson. Yeah, you know, I, I think as long as we have uh, enough to discuss in those in those meetings, um, I think our uh, I, I wouldn't have an issue um, having you know more than one meeting. You know, scheduling is going to be tough. Um, thank you, Debbie, <laughs> for uh, doing all your work just to schedule you know those two in October and November. It wasn't it wasn't easy getting everyone scheduled to match. Um, so. You know, with with that in mind, is like if if there is something of substance, I would be okay with meeting more. Um, but uh, to to Ms. Sierra's point, you know, I think a lot of the work is going to transition to this uh, subcommittee, and um, perhaps that's the better outlook for us. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Thompson, um, I would agree with with Vincent's comments that if if we have things to 
meet on, I'm happy to meet more frequently. I think we need to front load our, our level of effort, which I think is implied in what, what um, Ms. Delatory's comments are. Uh, you know, we've all talked about the deadlines we're up against. I, I, I would caution us against supplanting staff resources with our own time. And we're not, the, we're not meant to be the staff of the agency. We just are somewhat, uh, I think we're, we are taking over a little bit of those functions in, because we don't have folks on board. So whatever we can do to more quickly bring whatever resources we can on board to do things faster, other than through our own efforts, um, I, I think would be time extremely well spent. So how, how we can do that, how I can contribute to that, how the rest of us can contribute to that. Uh, I know that there's a lot of work that's been going on by the chairperson, by the staff that we have on loan from agencies that are, thank you for, for doing what, what you're doing. I'd meant to ask, you, you'd sent, you made mention of having sent a formal request to the attorney general for staff resources, um, what form that, that request took because I, I think we need to get more people of many different types as fast as we possibly can. And the best kind of people we can probably get are the ones who've worked on this before. Um, but if, if it's not them, then I think we need to identify what our second and third preference types of resources are because just, we just don't have enough people, uh, uh, even with all of us. Um, and Meeting twice as frequently, I don't think is going to make up for, you know, tens of people that we, we ideally should have on board um, as soon as possible. And, and I, I just want to clarify that, I'm, I mean, if we do the math and we're thinking that we have to have a package ready by May, we have seven meetings ahead if we continue to meet monthly. And I do not see the meetings as something that will subtract from the subcommittee work, I think it's something that it will add to the subcommittee work. Because one of the things that we really have to think about is how we can build consensus in terms of the two packages of rules that we will have to approve in an open meeting before we even put them out for comment. So when you think about all those additional steps that apply to us because of back leaking, I believe that meeting more frequently, even if it's a meeting for three hours, where the subcommittees can bring up things that they are considering in terms of policy, which direction to go with any specifics of the rulemaking and gathering the feedback from the other members so that when we come out with a version of the rules and we present it to the board for approval, we account for the different perspectives of all of the board members. I think that actually that's gonna put it in a much better, in a much better position to accomplish the goals of the subcommittee. I particularly, I'm thinking about my subcommittee where everything is new. All of the rules have not been drafted. So I anticipate that as we are having that conversation as a subcommittee, we will benefit from input from the other members of the board. And the only process whereby we can get that input is an open meeting. Um, so again, I appreciate the efforts that everybody has put in place. I, I am aware of the challenge. I just, I just believe that realistically, if you count the amounts left, there is no path that is viable to us achieving what we're set up to achieve unless we switch to a calendar that allows us to meet twice a month. And maybe we can have meetings that are shorter. Instead of having a five hour meeting or a nine hour meeting, we can have a three, four hour meeting that is more um, concentrated that we can discuss things that are more policy oriented that might be on top of, top of mind for the different um, subcommittees. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Um, so, um, my well, I'm I'm the chair, and that this does make me slightly biased. 
um, in favor of certainty um, and having uh, a schedule. Um, I also, um, however, have to acknowledge that preparing for a public meeting is by itself a lot of work. Um, it does, there is, there is a competition there um, in the work that you're doing. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. I also um, want to be clear that I am willing to work um, as hard as I absolutely can to secure resources um, for as many meetings um, as we would like to have and as many meetings, of course, as we need. And there have been some hard limits that are not tied to anybody not wanting to help us out or um, not working um, to, um, to provide us what we need. Um, so I just want to be clear about those things because I think that it's important um, to be transparent about those things. Um, with that said, um, Ms. De La Torre, as I understand it, proposed, I believe, Ms. De La Torre, that the board members um, consider committing to some recurrent dates starting in December. Um, I um, would not be able to commit the staff, but I do think that we're on a path um, to, um, to have more resources over the next couple of months. Um, so with, I just, I, you know, there's only so much that we can do, but I believe that to be the case. Um, and so I think what the question is the sense of the board on um, changing our recurrent meeting schedule and commitment starting in December um, to two times a month. And I believe Ms. De La Torre, you were suggesting some concrete options, perhaps just um, in order to go ahead right. and apply those. My, my original suggestion was to just, since we are on a Tuesday, just to agree on the first and third Tuesday of the month with the understanding that we can change that in a meeting. So when we come back in October 18, if there is any reason why any particular, um, you know, first or third Tuesday is not viable, we, we can discuss changing that. I do believe that that um, ability to predict the schedule way in advance is also potentially going to be helpful in terms of enabling us to, to secure the resources because we will have certain dates. I'm flexible. If somebody wants to suggest something else, I just um, was trying to avoid a Monday or a Friday because those tend to be more, um, they, they tend to be more holidays um, on Mondays and Fridays, but I don't have any particular attachment to Tuesday other than today's Tuesday. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Um, I, I would need to check my calendar, um, but the, um, the thought of having a, um, some sort of set um, expectations um, that we can go to. I apologize that we can go to staff with and maybe come back um, and revise the dates, not necessarily the frequency if we need to. Um, uh, is um, uh, I, I generally support the idea. Um, I also hear what board members are saying, and I do realize that we have been asking you to do a lot. Um, right. So I would like to um, go around the room um, and just have a final sense, and maybe we will have consensus on this item. One thing that I want to mention before we go around the room is that it's much easier to cancel a meeting that has been put in a schedule than to generate a new one. So, you know, the fact that we commit to two days doesn't necessarily mean that we cannot have a conversation in October about changing a date in December because it's close to Christmas. Um, but I think it will be really helpful to just generate that expectation in advance, at least until the end of rulemaking. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Yes, and I mean, I want to check for Passover and right. Eve and so forth. All right, um, Mr. Lay. Yeah, um, I, I think yeah, it's going to be tough for us. I mean, the Tuesday, we can, we can figure out the date, but um, if, if they're all day meetings, that's going to be tough uh, with other responsibilities. Um, 
So if we knew they were only going to be like two or three hours, right. um, that-, that, that would be more appropriate and more possible, I think, from a log- logistical standpoint. And uh, just, just to add to what um, Mr. Thompson Secretary said is, um, I think it's becoming clear that once we hire this ED, we probably should try to find a legislative champion to, um, to push back this deadline. Uh, it just, it, it doesn't feel right for, you know, the subcommittee to be like writing the, all of the rules kind of uh, from, from based on our experiences. And, um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of countries and a lot of states are, are, are looking at California for putting out good rules um, for, for this. And I would hate to rush them um, you know, on that, in, in a way we don't have to uh, and just create more problems down the line. I'd rather get a good set of rules out earlier. So um, a little unrelated to that, but I uh, just wanted to make, make that point. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I think we are balancing a lot of things. So I do think it is relevant. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Sierra. I apologize if I'm going in alphabetical order. And Mr. Thompson, you and I, next meeting, we're gonna go backwards. Um, okay. <laughs> my long time experience I was being at the end of the line. Um, Ms. Sierra? Um, you know, I do, I, I think the point um, Ms. Delatorre makes about consensus building is a really good one, you know, and if we are meeting more often, you know, I think that will help. I think, you know, it may be, or about just you know, bringing the point about talking about issues just in development. And I like the idea though, again, and realistically, maybe they're shorter meetings if we're meeting more often. You know, I still see there is like this tension between the different things we're doing. You know, there is work that's just kind of, you have to focus on preparing for a board meeting, but you know, on balance, um, I'm supportive. I just, you know, I, I do think that um, focusing on the most important agenda items for each meeting will be key if, if we move forward in that way. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. And I think that we can trust the, the chair to deal with that, to help us prioritize what goes into each meeting and, and just agree to have shorter, more targeted meetings. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. I don't always have insight, um, but the other thing we can combine that with is what we've been doing today, which is subcommittees reporting back and um, recommending priorities. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, it, is the question our willingness to do more frequent meetings? Uh, I believe the, the question is, um, yes, willingness to do more frequent meetings. And um, specifically, Ms. De La Torre has proposed that we commit to two meetings, events, um, at least starting in December. And she had proposed as a, as a um, uh, straw man, I think, um, to, to the second and the first and third Tuesday. Um, Correct. Uh, Correct, thank you. The first and third Tuesday. I realize, I realize and I do wanna emphasize that I have to go back and figure out if that, that is possible, but it, it would give you something to work with. Right. So whether or not it's the first and third Tuesdays of the month, I'm happy to do more frequent meetings. I agree with the comments that have been made that they should be shorter and more focused because you know multiple six, seven, eight hour a day or uh, per meeting meetings would see is is a lot. Um, I think there are multiple actions, and I'm sorry to repeat myself, that we have to take in order to accelerate. That's one. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think we need a dozen staff to fall out of the sky also. Um, and how we can make that happen. If I was going to pick one thing, a dozen people up to speed falling out of the sky would be, uh, I think, more urgent. So whatever we can do to accelerate the staffing as well, because there's only so much the five of us can do. Plus, as you said, chairperson, you know, prep for the meetings burns staff, the limited staff resources we have um, uh, on tasks that are not necessarily, well, they are, they are related to moving us forward towards, towards rules. So that would be an unfair characterization to say that they aren't, but um that my, my number one priority would be accelerate this, the staffing. I'm happy to do more meetings. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. My number one wish would be a fully formed team of 12 people falling out of the sky as well. Um, and I hear um, and acknowledge and agree with your point that continuing to push um, in every direction um, to develop a team 
uh, is, is a priority. Um, can we, um, in principle, um, agree that I um, will take the second and, excuse me, the first and third Tuesdays of each month, um, talk with staff, um, uh, talk perhaps with the Attorney General's office and figure out what we can do for resources. Um, uh, we're gonna have to have meetings and hearings and everything in any case. Um, and it would help me if I had something to shoot for with the recognition that um, Ms. Castanon may be writing you if it turns out that there's some unforeseen um, issue and ask about um, some other um, scheme, um, but with the goal of having um, a scheme um, if we can. I, I support that. Okay, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, um, uh, let's just go around the room again, um, and then if we are in support, then uh, we can move on. Mr. Lay? Yeah, that, that works for me. Thank you, Ms. Sierra? I support that as well. Thank you, Mr. Thompson? Good with me. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. All right, I will do my best, and I appreciate um, everybody, uh, you know, making, working to make things work. Um, when uh, when it is when it is a lot of time and, and resources to ask. Um, thank you very much, um, members of the board. Um, I will now reclose out um, agenda item number one and move to agenda item number seven. We have three agenda items remaining um, and a um, date with our closed session. Um, so I do not want to limit um, substantive discussion, but I do would like people to be aware of the deadline, and if I'm asking you to move along, if you can, um, it is with that in mind. Agenda item number seven um, is a revisitation of the delegation of authority for limited administrative functions we discussed in the last meeting. Um, this is the limited delegation that allows me to do things like sign contracts, um, and as Ms. Delatore mentioned earlier in the meeting, um, approve hiring um, for the positions that are not carved out. Uh, and that kind of thing. Um, it's based on section 1798.199.135 of the civil code from the CPRA, which says that the agency board may delegate authority to the chairperson or executive director to act in the name of the agency between meetings of the agency with two very important exceptions, enforcement and rulemaking authority. Um, I will go ahead and bring the delegation that's been circulated up on the screen uh, for members of the public. Um, this is also um, on the website. Um, uh, the only change to the delegation um, is uh, to change the, the date. Um, um, please bear with me for one second. I've shared a lot of documents today. Um, all right, and um, with that, I will open this for board comment. I've read it. I think it's good. I'm ready to move its adoption. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, boy, uh, Mr. Lay and Ms. Latoya happened at the same time. Um, Ms. Mr. Mr. Lay. Oh, yeah, just uh, I thought we were going to make a motion, but yeah, I'm, I'm fine with extending the day. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Latoya. I am fine as well. I will suggest that if we're meeting in the next month, we need to consider how we're going to transfer this delegation to the executive director at, at that point. I also think that we might want to consider the idea of delegating uh, authority to a vice chair to support the work that the chair is doing. We don't have time to discuss that today. Perhaps that's something that we can um, discuss in our next meeting. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, that is a, it is a very important um, issue um, that I am uh, aware of and paying attention to. We will need to transfer the authority um, uh, cleanly um, to the executive director. 
Um, uh, and uh, the vice chair um, ideas is also noted. Thank you. Ms. Sierra, did you have comment? No. Thank no. you. Um, is there comment from those in the audience? Uh, as a reminder, if anyone would like to make a public comment at this time, please press the raised hand icon on your screen or press star nine if you're connected by telephone. I am not seeing any public comments on this item. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Joseph Pinero. Um, may I have a motion to approve the delegation of authority um, as reviewed for this meeting, which starts from this meeting to goes to the next meeting um, with the carve outs that we decided upon last time. I also move. Thank I'll second. You. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Ms. Sierra moves. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Lay seconds. Mr. Joseph Pinero, would you please call the roll call vote? Certainly. Uh, Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Ms. De La Torre, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. Sierra, aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson, aye. And Chairperson Urban? Aye. Chairperson Urban, aye. The vote is 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. The motion carries. Uh, and we will um, operate under this delegation of authority until the next meeting. Um, we will be um, sure to have a plan for clean um, transfer of delegation authority to the executive director. Um, and I will take under advisement the vice chair um, and, uh, uh, and, um, and, and uh, consider and research that. Uh, thank you to the board for, um, uh, for carefully considering and efficiently um, uh, working on, and excuse me, it has been a long day. I do apologize. I've been talking a lot. Um, I will start over. Um, thank you to the board for carefully considering and efficiently disposing of this item. We will now move on to agenda item number eight, public comments on items not on the agenda. Um, this is an opportunity for public comment um, for any item, not, those, not just those that are on the agenda. Before we proceed with public comment, please note that the only action the board can take on these items is to listen to comments and consider whether it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. No other action may be taken on the item at the meeting. Though this may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, these following these guidelines is critical to ensure that the rules of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising either the commenter's goals or the board's mission. Um, and with that, Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there any public comment? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, so it looks like we have one comment initially. As a reminder for anyone else who'd like to make a public comment on this item, please press the raised hand on your screen or press star nine if you're connected by telephone. So our first comment is Ray Kitty. Uh, you have three minutes to make your comment. Hello, um, I just wanted to um, sunshine my concern for uh, privacy rights of previously incarcerated people. I think this uh, is a, something that deserves some attention. For example, um, somebody who is in jail but not convicted of a crime, there is a lot of information out on public websites. I can point you to Sutter County, Sheriff, Alpine County, every, you know, all, all these counties share a lot of information. Information scrapers scoop that up and it's out there forever. Plus, when people, um, when their uh, crimes are uh, uh, expunged, you know, we expunged all marijuana convictions and things like that. What happens to the data that is now held by the data vendors? They got it a year ago, two years ago. Do they get rid of that data now that that crime's been expunged? I don't think they do. And so I just wanted to highlight that as an issue. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Mr. Joseph Pinero, are there further public comments? Uh, there are no further public comments at this time. Oh, sorry. My hand came up as I was saying that. Uh, we have a comment from Barry Weber. I actually have a, a question that may require putting something on a future agenda. So as I understand it, the, uh, the employee exemption is, is due to expire on uh, 
January 1st, 2023. And I would assume that if that occurs, then it's covered by one of the regulation subcommittees that's dealing with what already exists in CCPA. Um, if that's not clear, or if the um, agency has the ability to itself um, um, extend the employee exemption, it's not clear to me. And I'm just looking for either an understanding of that or possibly adding something to the next agenda. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Mr. Phillips, is it proper to um, clarify where that is with the subcommittees? Um, you, you certainly, if it's a simple question like that, you shouldn't really um, go into any detail or discussion about um, comments that are not on the agenda. Um, if it's like a one subcommittee uh, answer, I don't think that's a big deal, but, um, but yes, be careful about discussing things not on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. This is, was an agendized item earlier in the day. I would simply um, refer Mr. Weber to the presentation from the regulation subcommittee. Uh, if you go to the supplemental materials, um, you will see which subcommittee that issue rests with. Mr. Joseph Pinero, um, are there any additional public comments? I'm not seeing any at this moment, but I'll give just a couple more seconds. I see no further public comments on this item. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph Pinero. We now turn to agenda item number 13, a discussion of future agenda items. This is an opportunity um, for board members to offer future agenda items, um, along with any um, information you have about prioritization um, for, for potential consideration in a future meeting. Um, we have a list of items, I think, from our discussion today, as well as some from June 14th meeting. Um, obviously, um, hiring, interviews, and decisions by the board on the relevant positions, additional reports from subcommittees. We have the notice to the Attorney General regarding our authority to do rulemaking as a holdover. Um, the delegation of authority um, lasts only between meetings, um, and we will need to consider transfer to the Executive Director. The conflict of interest code that is currently out for public comment. Um, uh, may need to be considered again with a vote or may not. I will find that out, but that is also on the list. Um, and the um, other things that we discussed today, um, informational um, hearings, um, uh, uh, engaging with the public. We also have the possibility of further informational presentations. As Mr. Thompson alluded to earlier, um, we can be trained all together um, if we publicly, if we notice a public meeting. Um, we do have some items that I want to be sure um, uh, I, I convey or have not gone um, unnoticed. Um, we just haven't gotten to them today um, or yet. One is the question of whether um, California might apply for adequacy under the EU regime that Ms. De La Torre brought up next time. Um, there's also, um, there was a specific um, a question about the communications policy. Um, we did end up, um, a we did end up at least clarifying that as long as board members do not um, make sure that they just, that they make clear that they are not speaking for the agency of the board, they are free to speak in public. Um, but um, uh, Ms. De La Torre had some questions about some specific conferences. Um, and um, that, is, that is what I have on my list initially. Are there initial um, uh, future agenda items from board members? Mr. Lay. Um, yeah, perhaps uh, a presentation um, from, from someone about kind of a little bit more detail on the legislative process or requesting um, an extension of time. Uh, what steps do we have to take um, or the ED hopefully by then to, to get that? Thank you, Mr. Lay. Further potential future agenda items from board members? Thank you, board members. Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there public comment? I'm not seeing any at this moment. As a reminder, if anyone would like to make a public comment, please press the raised hand uh, or press star nine on your telephone. I see no public comments on this item. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. 
We will now move to item 10 on our agenda for today, which is a closed session item. The board will now go into closed session for the discussion of and possible action on the appointment of an executive director. Um, closed session is under the authority of government code 1126 subsection A sub subsection one. We will return to this public session briefly when we are finished with the closed session today. Um, we do hope to be done with the closed session by about five o'clock. When we return, um, we will um, come back into public session, but go directly into recess until 11 a.m. tomorrow morning when we will continue in closed session. I would like to express my deep gratitude um, to everyone on the board um, for all the work that you've been doing and the work today in this meeting. Um, my gratitude to Mr. Joseph Pinero, Ms. Debbie Castanon, um, who has been taking minutes and has done so much to make this meeting happen, Mr. Chris Phillips for being our um, meeting council, Ms. Layla Mirashidi, um, who's also done so much to make this meeting happen, uh, and multiple staff at DCA, DGS, um, the board, um, and, um, and other groups for, um, for all of the um, help that they've given us so that we can do this. And I would like to thank the public um, for its attention and valuable participation. Um, with that, um, we will um, recess um, board members. We will return um, to go into public session. Um, I propose that we go into public session and then do a quick discussion of the schedule there. Um, I realize people may need a short break um, and uh, I, um, I, I suggest that we, well, maybe we need to figure that out now. Um, may, so um, I just realized we would be in closed session. Um, so if people would like a short break, um, please let me know um, and we can take a short break and the board will be convened in closed section, session at a certain time. I was um, just hoping to understand, we, do we log off and then we have to log in on a different link? Is that what's gonna happen? And That's you will give the time? That is correct. Um, I, I will be sure we will meet you there um, at the link that we have for the closed session. That was my question. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we will leave this meeting. It will remain open, um, but we will leave and um, we will reconvene at the closed session link. Um, I will make an executive decision that we will reconvene at 2.50. Um, and I thank you all for your continued efforts and energy and thanks to the public. Um, uh, we will see you again later. Thanks.